the Diesel Podcast. Developing innovation in English as a second or other language. Episode 64, Librarians and Language Learners with Jen Giffen. Welcome to Diesel. This is episode 64. We are your hosts. I am Brent Warner. And I'm Ishelle Reyes. Hey, Brent. Hi. Happy summer vacation for you. I'm there. We're there. We're in vacation time. Living it up. And I heard you are not teaching this summer. That's true. I am not teaching. So Mm -hmm. let me introduce you to our co-host, Pool Boy Brent. <laughs> In case this has not been made clear, uh, I've taken a summer job as a pool boy, hot pool boy summer. Um, and so, yeah, uh, so I am out there uh, swabbing the decks and sweeping the algae and uh, skimming the surfaces, all of those types of things. I'm learning. I'm learning. And you're wearing SPF. I'm definitely wearing SPF. It is hot out there. I am I am exhausted. Like my weird muscles in my hands that I didn't know that I have are like getting all bulked out and uh, you know, I'm 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 going to be ripped and tan by the end of the summer. Little little cabana pool boy. So Yeah. I, um, so we need me to feature a picture of you with your uh your wide brim hat. Yeah, no, I've got some pictures I'll, I'm I'm going to be posting this soon. So um Cool, cool, cool. Summertime is here. <laughs> and like, I know we're talking about all of this and Jen is sitting in the in the uh, corner <laughs> waiting to be introduced so that she can comment on this. <laughs> she has no idea what's going on. Hi, Jen. Hi. Hi. <laughs> How are you? Um, well, you know, I've never been on a podcast where we start with Speedos. So uh, yeah, that's yeah. new. This is new. Thank well, you. It's, a, Thank it's you. a uniform, you know, we do. We have to wear... <laughs> Speedos and sandals and a wide brim hat, and that's all. That's all we're allowed to wear. So it's um, we it we've lost all me. of the accounts in one day. Like I don't know what happened. <laughs> <laughs> like everybody fired us immediately. So it's okay. You just haven't found your you haven't found your niche yet. Yeah. I, I feel like there's a niche for you, Brent. We'll get there. We'll get there. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So uh, today we have Jen Giffen. Jen, welcome to the show. Woo-hoo. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. All right. So Jen, uh, for those who don't know, and I think probably everybody does, but Jen Jen is a teacher librarian and former digital literacy consultant in the York region DSB. What's DSB stand for? District School Board. Okay, so that is... So you guys have ISDs in the States and we have DSBs here in Ontario. Okay, Mm. so the the difference up there in in Ontario. Um, So she has a master's in curriculum teaching and learning from OISE and a specialist in integration of information and computer technology. Also, a lot of the things that people might know you for here is that you're the co-host of the Shooks and Gift podcast, uh, Google Innovator, Sketchnoter, teacher matchmaker, cheerleader, and up for just about anything, former player of the game of school, and now she seeks to ensure learning is authentic and relevant, especially for struggling students. So, Jen, you do so much stuff, so much different <laughs> stuff. I, I mean, know, we, I really do. Yeah, we can go with like a million <laughs> different, like, and, and not to mention you're also, I, I don't know, you know, you're a mother of three or four kids. Is that right? Three. I have three boys. Yeah, I have like, three boys. You would imagine that you would be like just busy enough with that. And then you're like, no, I'm just going to take on all these other things as well. Yeah, I it's you know what? I've, I've actually in the last month or so and, and I just renovated my house, like top we gutted <laughs> my house and moved out for almost four months. And it was during that in the last month, I've really been like, I'm just going to for the first time, maybe in my life, pause a little bit. So like I haven't podcasted in a couple of months and I, I didn't do a, like an official end. We are not in summer yet. So thanks. Oh. Thanks for uh, rubbing that in here. Mm-hmm. Cause we still have a month. We go until the 30th of June. Wow. Up here. Wait, when does but school we don't start go, for you guys? Um, the Tuesday after Labor Day. Oh, well, so you guys go till se- after yeah September. Yeah. yeah. Because our hot months, like we get those six weeks of like heat in Canada and it's in July. And August. Yeah. And then it's like cold for the rest of the year. So you, yeah, you guys and are then taking advantage cold. of that time for sure. Exactly. So if you, if you want to bring your like pool boy skills up this way, I don't have a pool, but I could like maybe get one of those like blow up turtle ones Inflatable. and like, put that in my backyard. And I'm, I don't know. I It'd mean, probably be really expensive. As but. long as I can stand around in speedos and flip flops, like you just put me anywhere and that's fine. That's, that's fine. It's um, well, what's temperature today? I think it's like 58 degrees here today. So 58, know, holy crap. Well, it might be a little, well, just right now this morning was cold. It's going up to 
something. I don't know. I, I have to do my, it's going up to 21 degrees, but Celsius. It's Celsius. Mm, yeah, yeah. No, it's we're not going yeah. that. I'll, I'll say, oh, no, it's, it's, oh, it's almost 60 here. Hold on. It is currently 59 degrees, 59 degrees today with a high of 68, which is a lovely day here for this time of year. We were in, but we were like, feels like 94 last week. It was, un- we, we said, we like shattered records. Anyway, we're not here to talk On this episode of the Diesel <laughs> Podcast, Jen Giffen decides to teach us a little bit of weather, <laughs> weather forecasting and meteorology. Do you know what? We used to have a live-in nanny from the Philippines. And when she came here after about six months, she looked at me one day, she's like, why do you guys talk about the weather so much? <laughs> I mean, we really do. It's all we talk about. Because like in beautiful California, it's like, oh, it's warm and sunny again today. Oh, it's hot. <laughs> we don't have that. Like it really fluctuates. So when we get weather, like we, ha- we You've have- You've got to weather. enjoy it. Yeah. You gotta talk, yeah. That's you how you know. If weather. someone's truly mm-hmm. Canadian, you will know. Because if they haven't brought up the weather at some point in your conversation, they're an imposter. They're not actually from Canada. <laughs> they're sne- <laughs> yeah. sneaking in from that, Southern California. Yeah. That and the aboots, right? And the aboots. A boot. But aboots is not boot. quite right, though, boot. right? Because no. we watched Letterkenny, right? Uh, oh, I and, love Letterkenny. And they were, they were given a, a joke about that, about how, like, they don't quite say a boot. It's more like a boot. It's not a boot. A boot. It's about. It's about. about. You'll, you'll, it'll come out. I hear it when, I, when I'm when i on with American friends, and I, I'll say it. And I'm like, oh, there it is. I heard it. But I don't hear it when I'm speaking to Canadian friends. But, yeah, <laughs> it, isn't, it isn't a boot. And Letterkenny is not, you know, Letterkenny is set only about 90 minutes. See, I, I said it there. Did you hear it? Um, it's only about 90 minutes away, like that. the town it's supposed to be based in from where I live. So it's a little bit more country than the suburbs that I'm in, but I'm like, you watch it. I'm like, yeah, it's pretty accurate. <laughs> I've, I've heard a few people say that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, okay. Well, so Jen, one of the big reasons we want to have you on is um, we want to talk about librarians and language learners. Um, mm-hmm. And so I think this is like, this is another, an area we haven't really talked about very much. And yeah. obviously our you, first, first librarian, right? We haven't had anybody. Yeah. Yeah. First librarian, first Canadian. Woo-hoo. Is it first Canadian? Yeah. Yeah, you're, you're breaking all sorts of records here. Jenny. Yes, Love we've it. interviewed someone in Canada now. Well, we're about Call to. Guinness. <laughs> Call <Yes>. Guinness. <laughs> we're setting records. Sorry, Brent. All totally meant to cut you off. No, no. <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, we wanted to get you in on and just to start talking because I think a lot of people teachers might neglect the librarian or the resources that the librarians have to offer. Um, mm-hmm. And not, not necessarily intentionally, but I think a lot with language learning too. And with like, Hey, what are, what are things that librarians do now that are, you know, like it, I think there's still a lot of holding on to the old idea of like, they walk me down the, the book stacks and take me and point me to where a book is. And then they walk away <laughs> type of thing. And, and, yeah. uh, and, you know, being a librarian obviously is, is quite a bit different these days. Um, mm-hmm. And so I guess we kind of wanted to start talking about that and see like, like one, what do you do as a librarian, but two, also how does that, uh, like what, what types of resources or what are you offering and how, how are you able to um, give support to language learners and to, to TESOL teachers as well? Yeah. So I think there's a lot of different things we can do. The, the, now, like, let's not neglect the books. Like, there is the whole, yeah, we're going to walk down and show you where oh, books Oh, yeah, sorry. Are. I didn't mean to talk trash and on the books. <laughs> no, yeah. Don't trash the books, Brent. <laughs> books are fantastic. <laughs> um, no, but it, 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 we do more than that. But there are there are certain things. So, for example, um, in our collection, and I gave a lot of thought to where I wanted to put um, leveled readers, for example, or easier readers and those high-low books um, that we buy for students who come in at, you know, very, like, early language acquisition and do we put them in with the rest of the collection do we put them separately and that's a big conversation for teacher librarians to have and particularly with you know our the english language uh teacher the english language learner teachers um and, and just say like where where do you want them and i i talked to our head of um of ell is actually going to be working with me in the library next year so we have eight sections of library in our school and i get six that's a full time table for me and then so but then when i have my prep period someone needs to be in there and i sort of lobbied hard to get her in she's a fantastic teacher her name's vivian cortez and she just has a lot of insight into what could be done and i really feel that the library collection and the space is is a real place and a hub for our english language learner students um so with her she and i spoke and i said well where do you want to put them and we decided to put some on their own so that the students could come in and not be intimidated and have to seek through and you know the, the large collection but then we put a whole bunch 
in the collection so that the students, especially, um, so we, we level them here in Ontario, A, B, C, D, E, and E being like the sort of most acquired language. Mm. Um, our ESLD and E students could go and not feel like, oh, I'm still reading these books because my English isn't great yet. But they, but they could still find things for themselves in the collection. We have spine labels that are, you know, can really help with that. Um, we don't um, genreify our library. It, it's fully done like alphabetically by author's name. Okay. And so we have our early readers or like our easy readers or leveled readers, some of them in one area. So that's sort of like, but a lot of them are just in our collection, which I think is good. And a lot of students have said that. And you can see when they come in, if they sort of feel like, no, I, I want to read the book. It's almost like if you were like in primary and you have a kid wanting to read sort of the older, the middle school books, they'd, they'd go, oh, I can, I can be in here. And I don't know. I think there's something to be said for that, right? Because you want to meet their needs. And some kids, they just like, no, just show me where the books are that I can read. And other kids are like, no, I want to be in with everyone else. I don't want to look like I, I don't know what I'm doing, particularly when students are coming down with a non-English class, right? If they're coming down, let's say for a social science or history, whatever it happens to be. And it's not like, oh, I, I don't, I don't only really want to go over there because everyone else can read those. And I, I feel like I'm dumb. And they're mm -hmm. like, we know that that's not the case. Right. And so often um, people who are acquiring a language and as someone who at one point was fully fluent in four languages. Um, and now I would say I'm, I'm fluent in like two and two half languages. Oh, what, are, what are your um, languages, Jen? I didn't know that. Well, I speak French, right? Because I'm Weep. Canadian. Um, and, but I, in high school, I picked up uh, Spanish and then in university, I picked up Italian. So by the, when I was about 23, 24 years old, I was fluent in both Spanish and Italian. Now I haven't practiced them um, in a long time, so I can understand it and I can read some of it, but I can't always find the words. But I know for me too, right? Like I, I, when I'm speaking in Spanish or when I, even when I'm speaking in French, I'm not, I'm not a stupid person, but I can't always find the words. And I think that's, I think that a lot of our, our, you know, English language learners feel that way too. Like I, I know what I want to say in my language. So I don't want to go to these like baby looking books and then people are going to think I'm dumb because I have my ideas there. I just don't have necessarily the resources. And these are things that of course we can help with as teacher librarians. So putting things in a certain area, labeling them is very important, I think, so that students know where to find them. I also really make a point of doing, um, you know, um, orientations at the beginning of every year for our grade nine students and also all of our ESL classes. Because a lot of the students, we as librarians and like I'm a high school librarian. So when we come in in grade nine, we think, OK, well, you got it in grade nine. But how many of our students are not in grade nine and have come to the school and don't know the space? So I think it's so important to capture those like students, so to speak, and bring them in and say, OK, this is what's happening here. And, and not just our level A's and B's, but also like right up because they might just be here. For, so, for example, we just um, we had a new student enroll maybe three weeks ago from the Ukraine, came here because of, you know, everything going on over there with her mom and, and her siblings and her her dad's still back fighting the war and it's mm. you know it was a, a big point of and I always ask our guidance department too and this is something else I would encourage teacher librarians to do um, or you know the ESL teachers do is make sure that as part of the orientation for the school when they're walking around have a, a point of coming into the library space because it's also a really good spot that you find a lot of kids who are there on their own. And I call it the land of the misfit toys sometimes, right? It's like everyone has their purpose. Like you remember that scene in, in Rudolph when, um, when they run into the Yeti and then they, they're all hiding and they find all those elves who want to do other things and the one's a dentist. It's like, okay, I, you don't make toys, but you make a really good dentist. And look, you were able to, you know, solve the problem the Yeti was having. And I find in the library what happens is, especially in high school, when they have, you know, spares or they have lunch, especially we don't have a common lunch. So we have these students who come in and they haven't really found their, their crew yet. And they come in on their own. And, and this is where I think it's sort of a really long answer to what you asked, but you know, we can set up makerspace activities and I, I think I have a puzzle table and I've seen more friendships foster through those activities. And it could be, you know, someone who like, we have a lot of students from Iran, for example, we have someone who's like new from Iran and they'd be sitting there working, then they'd hear someone speaking Farsi and then they can turn around and they can meet them really quickly and different than in a, than a cafeteria or in a hallway, right? Because you're already, you have these cliques. But if you're like sitting doing a puzzle and you're like, oh, hey, can I join you? And I start speaking to you in Farsi as well. And I've seen so many beautiful friendships flourish just from the space, right? That third teacher idea that mm -hmm. what's around them really can help teach them and, and foster even the soft skills, not just the hard skills that we're teaching students. So there's a lot. Right? There's a lot that can be unpacked in a library to really support students academically and socially. Yeah, and I, I love that idea of, you know, the, the kind of the third space, the place. Mm -hmm. I, I, I have been on a mission around my campus of saying, like, 
you know, classroom design is pedagogy. It matters. <laughs> like it absolutely matters how, thing, how things are built, how things are put together, what the relationship between furniture and places are and those types of things as well. Um, because it helps because you can guide it in ways that get the mm-hmm. students together with each other or let them separate from each other, you know, like depending on their own needs. And so I, I love to hear all that. And then I, I also really like this idea. And I, I think this could be a benefit because it does go into like UDL principles. All For me, I'm always like, hey, if you're planning for ESL, you're doing UDL <laughs> and it, but pretty much by default, right? Because it's going to help other students. And so I love that idea of, um, you know, if you, if they walk in, and you go, okay, here's a stack just for you guys, right? Like, doesn't it's not hard to find. It's easy. It's accessible. And it guides you into the rest of the library. It guides you into the rest of the places to find other things, too. And so I think that type of setup, like that intentional setup for providing for the students is is a really big deal, right? And I think it, it might get overlooked. I don't know, Michelle, if you've had any experiences with those, too. Um, well, I'm actually happy to hear that... Um based on what I've observed with our library, now I'm hearing Jen speak about it. And um, I work with adults, of course, but um, our librarians have um, tried to make sure that students do know that it's accessible, that do know that they can go in there for books. And one of the things I've observed is they often have these passive activities going on. So for example, on one wall, they had whatever the theme of the month is, um, students can vote. So there's tallies, but they also go by countries and by languages. And so I think one of them was like friendship day. And I think students who were in the library could um, in the, on a little, I don't know, they, they cut like little shapes of a leaf, or like, like a tree leaf or something. And they had to write like, how do you say a uh, friend in your language? And so, you know, students, just random students would gather there and then they would start talking to each other from different countries, different languages. So, so it was a place for them to meet outside of their, you know, outside of their usual group. And as you said, it, um, it may be a student of a higher level. And I've observed many times where immediately as they walk into our library, there's a big, um, there's a counter, of course, because they want to be able to guide the students who are new. And then there's a bookshelf of all like the penguin leveled readers. And then there's like the the like 10,000, whatever, a thousand vocabulary words you must know by group. So they're, they're you know, know but know what happens words. is you often have I've seen the students that are of a higher skilled, uh, higher skilled students will then guide the lower skilled students to where they think like, oh, here, start with this one and you need this one and that one. And so that's not something that the librarian is doing. Mm -hmm. But now you've had like the student guiding another student, giving them something that worked for them. And I've seen that happen over and over. And so I'm hearing, I'm sure that there's design that's gone into that. Um, I see it when I go in there, but now I'm really reflecting on the interactions I've seen because those are not, you know, those were designed uh, to happen there. So I'm, I'm happy to, to hear affirmation on that. I think too, there's like really purposeful conversations with students can be helpful. Like I, I'm really quickly, I go over the Dewey decimal system and I'm like, this is how we organize things here. So if you are on our sort of level readers or easy reader shelf and you find something in the nine seventies, and you're like, oh, this is a really good resource. You can also go to the 970s in the large collection and see if there's something there that might help as well that you might be might, might have access to. And it works the other way. I mean, I'll often say to students, they're like, oh, this is like, I really don't understand this concept. It's it's really difficult. I'm like, well, let's see if we can go. The, and I go back the other way as well to be like, this is something that might be at more of an elementary school level or easier language or more pictures in it, whatever it happens to be. Um, and just seeing that, you know, it's not just, you know, going back to the UDL idea, Brent. And I've, I've never, until you said that, I, for me, I've always thought UDL in terms of special education, right? It's it's for students with IEPs and that. And I don't know why I hadn't really considered it for our English language learners, right? This is, of course time. it is what we do for them. And and I've, always, I've, I've been doing UDL since I think before it had a name. I was like, well, why wouldn't you just give all kids extra time? And why, <laughs> why, why wouldn't you highlight keywords for everyone? Like, isn't this kind of, this is not just good teaching. Um, but I, I think there is something there. I know one thing that I did too at the beginning, Michelle, you, you talked about, you know, the, the friends, um, like how do you say friends in your language? Mm-hmm. When we were setting up, it was, a, when I moved into the space, it was a very traditional library. And I was hired because the, my principal wanted it to change. She's like, no, I want it to be more that like a learning commons more so than a library. And I said, yeah, that's great. Let's do it. And 
so I, one of the first things I did, we have a cricket machine, right? The like cutter, which is like so therapeutic. You can sit there and like watch it all day. And I had all this vinyl. And as kids came in, I was sitting near the circulation desk and I'd be like, hey, I'm like, I'm like, oh, I'm Mrs. Giffen. I'm the new librarian. And they, oh, hi, it's nice to meet you. And I said, do you speak any other languages? And they're like, well, yeah, at home we speak Korean. And I'm like, oh, how do you say hello in Korean? They'd be like, Anyang. It's like, do you know how to write it? And I would have them find, like go to Google with me and find a PNG. And we actually cut out, I think we have, 41 how to say hello in 41 different languages and different colors all across our front um, circulation mm. desk so when kids come up they'll look and they would say like well mine's not here like well how do you say it and what what language and let's go and then we we have them create so now you know they're learning about a tool that we have that they can use in the library but in a way that makes them feel like they've contributed to the space which is huge because it's not it's not my space like people are like oh what's going on in your library I'm like, it's not my library i don't own mm -hmm. it like i don't like you know i it's love all that our, our mm -hmm. space and in that even little things like that can be so inviting and every year since you know I, this is my third year now in the library so the two years following that when the grade nines or new students come in and they see they're like oh hey that i i speak you know farsi or i speak gujarati or whatever and and like, yeah, that's, that's all in my language. And then we have conversations about, you know, once we had something in Arabic and they were like, well, why, why could you write it in this way as well? And like, I love that students find each other through that. And I think it's really great. I also do a, would you rather every day you walk mm -hmm. in, it was something that I saw on Instagram and that's I started a it. Great idea. And it went nuts. It went, and it's the easiest thing I've ever done. I literally have a piece of plastic, like hard plastic that you'd usually put signs in. I take a dry erase marker and I just in Canva printed out something that said, Would you rather? And then a white box, two white boxes. And every morning I go in with my dry erase marker and I'm like, Okay, hey, what do we want? Or would you rather? And I put it on and then I have two cups and then I have a bowl of Lego, small, like the two Lego pieces. So it's just like, a, it's a vote. It's literally, you don't, there's no tally. You just put your piece of Lego in. And I have kids who will walk out from the hall, come in, just vote, and then leave because it's right through the front door. I need to do that with my adults. It's, that would it's be so awesome. <laughs> fun. And and the conversations, again, if we go back to the idea of, you know, when mm -hmm. they're doing puzzles, the conversations that happen even with that, you see a kid's up there and staring at it. Another kid will come up and be like, oh, this one's easy. And like yesterday, it was like pet dragon or pet dinosaur. And <laughs> kids are like, oh, no, for sure a dragon. And, and that kid would be like, but the fire, like they breathe and you lose your house. And, the, and, you know, you see ninth graders with 12th graders and we, we see, you know, students who are just acquiring English to students who are, you know, in our, our gifted AP English programs. And it's, uh, it's, it's a really cool thing to do. And like I said, it's that third teacher. It's just realizing that the space itself can, can really help build those relationships that can lead to like, lifelong friendships they can lead to tutoring opportunities they can you know you see each other again you're like oh I see oh you're in my class let's there's just so much that a library can do in that in that sense like so you know back to Brent's point and we're not just books it's not just like come in I will show you a book and then I will leave there is there is so much more <laughs> well I did want to jump in because you uh, uh, this is funny just because I was thinking about it the other day and not really related to anything but like I actually asked myself I'm like is the Dewey Decimal System still in place? And you are saying yes. Cause I'm like, I, and this is like an honest question because I'm like, do, do we need it with tech and like being able to look and, and this is, you know, you're look, you're like, you're mad dog at me, but this is like, <laughs> but I, I just haven't thought about it for a while. Like, uh, you know, of course I used it when I was a kid, when I was in college and all of those types of things. But I'm now I'm looking, I'm like, I, I was just thinking like so many kids are looking up things online or getting access to things, you know, on the internet. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not sure how prevalent it is, I guess. Uh, I'm just purely for information. I'd love to yeah, know. No, yeah. No. Yeah. So I don't, I don't actually buy a lot of nonfiction books anymore this year. The I'd say more than half of my budget went towards graphic novels because okay. that's what was getting kids in and they wanted it. And it was, like, when I put it up on yeah. our social media, it exploded and I bought maybe a thousand dollars worth of graphic novels. Mm -hmm. And then kids seem like, Oh, do you have this? Do you have this? And I put out a whiteboard just beside him. Like, Oh, what, what else could I add to the collection? And within an hour it was filled with titles, like mm. dozens of different titles and collections. Oh, get Bleach. Oh, get um, <laughs> My Hero Academia. Get all the, mm -hmm. like, and this was so not my niche. Like, mm -hmm. I'm like, I read Archie when I was a kid. <laughs> like, that's, that's about my extent, right? Um, and it was incredible to me that, you know, the students would come in and do this. But anyway, back to nonfiction. We, I don't buy a whole lot because it, it can go out of vogue. Right. Mm -hmm. Something that you have, you're like, okay, well, we don't really, we don't do that anymore. Like if I'm going to buy things on climate change, I, it, you know, in five, 10 years, it's going to be out. And that's why there's certain things that I, I put in and certain things I don't. So that's, that's sort of my beef with nonfiction is it, it can become obsolete very quickly. Mm. I also have a really 
tough time. I struggle a lot with Dewey because Dewey can be really biased and and quite frankly racist. Mm. There are a lot of classifications that were made. This is the early 19th or 20th mm-hmm. century, right? That Dewey did, did the classification system in the what the 1920s, I want to say. It could be that, but yeah, he died in 1930. He lived to be 80 years old though and died in 18 in 1930. So like really? at that time for a guy, yeah, I just learned that recently. This there's, there's there's my fun fact. There's my fun library <laughs> fact. Um yeah, he was 80 years old and at the like, turn of the century, like from the 18 to the 1900s, that's like ancient old. Anyway, um so there's a lot of stuff in there. Like um, if you look at what's one of them, if I'm, if I, I'm of course blanking on everything right now, but um, so if you wanted to have books on like Wiccan, for example, do you put those in religion and spirituality or do you put that in like folklore and, and he has it not in religion. Mm-hmm. And there are people who like Wiccans who would be like, this is my religion. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of things that we've ways that we progressed in society that Dewey doesn't really lend itself to. Now you can decide where you're going to put your books so you can change things around, but that makes it a little bit, you know, more challenging for kids if they're used to going to one area. I I've kept Dewey to this point because I'm like, well, if I want them to understand how libraries beyond our, you know, brick and mortar building are working. If they're going to a public library. If they're going to the university or college library, it's likely going to be Dewey. In fact, I don't know a single one that's not. So I want them to know how to search Dewey for that reason. And especially when you have Dewey and it's like, you know, 462.1649736, right? And like all the like breakdowns of the numbers. But there there are some problematic issues. There's a few librarians on TikTok who have talked about getting rid of Dewey altogether and coming up with their own classification system and why they did that to be more inclusive. Um, but, you know, I, I, I don't have enough. It's actually on my list to really dive into this summer hmm. uh, is to learn a little bit more about that. But I have read some pretty compelling articles to look at, like, hmm, maybe this is this needs to be changed. You know, however, 120 years or 100 years later, maybe we do need to revisit Dewey for those purposes. Hmm, interesting. I had never thought about it because I, ha- I just haven't used that system in so long. Um, I and our library is small enough that I know, oh, that's that section, that section. But yeah, I had never thought about that. Interesting. I'd like to probably check more out on TikTok. Yeah, I think that also makes sense too, because we're going through, I feel like a a big education revolution, you know, like it's, it's, you know, coming in from the bottom, like bottom up, you know, and a lot of, a lot of people are trying to make individual changes locally and then, and then hoping that those changes spread, you know, go on, go on bigger. And so I could absolutely see that shifting too, with so many, especially like in the last two or three years, just like so many people trying to push for, you know, better social justice, all those types of things as well. And so, um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of interesting, uh, yeah, a lot more to learn, I guess, and a lot, a lot of interesting places where that can go. Um, so Jen, I guess a couple of things we're, we're also looking for, cause obviously like you have a big focus on tech, you have, and, and we get, I don't even know if we're going to have time to get into like sketch noting and how that can help students. Too. Oh, sketch, we have <laughs> that. That's going to have to be a whole episode, Brett, yeah, cause we can, we... I know teachers that don't do, I don't think uh, in, in my group of colleagues, maybe they're, they're not familiar with, um, sketch noting. Oh my gosh. So I know, <laughs> I know, <laughs> so I know. Good. Uh, Jenda, Jenda's full trainings on all of this stuff. So we will mm-hmm. probably have you back to talk about that. Cause I just think we're going to mm-hmm, run out of absolutely. time. Cause I, I, I just know as soon as we let the leash go on that, you're just going to go. For, <laughs> yeah. That's, uh, that's a good hour. <laughs> so, so let's, uh, let's focus in on, on just some of the tech. Cause you, cause you know, I love on your show, you're just like, here's a cool tool. This is how you could use it. Right. Like a, a bunch of that kind mm-hmm. of fun stuff. Um, and you always have a tendency to come up with ones or, you know, find things that are different that I'm, I'm not aware of, or, or, you know, like I hadn't thought of in that perspective sometimes. And so are there any things out there that you love for, uh, and again, coming back to language learners as a priority, but you know, could be for all students as well. Um, what are some of the things that you feel are really capturing students' attention or helping them build and grow? Um, Google Read and Write is usually my first one. I love Google Read and Write. Like as we're we're a Google district, so the ability in there to you know, just set off certain immersive reader does it too, in really really well. If you're a Microsoft um, sort of you know, district. We, I I love it because it it has the translation built in for students. It can simplify. 
um, parts of speech for them. It can help. It can read to them. It has that uh, visual dictionary embedded. So if you're like, I don't really understand this word. What is it? It's not just, okay, now here's, you know, there's nothing worse than being like, I don't know what this word means. And then you read the definition. You're like, I don't know what three quarters of these words mean either. Fantastic. <laughs> right? Like how often does that happen? But I like that visual dictionary built in. I think, I think that's really huge. So, so that's, as a Google trainer, I think I should know what Google read and write is. And I don't, but we are not allowed to use Google in in my institution. But I actually would like to know about it because I don't know what it is. <laughs> so Google Read and Write is an extension. It's a Chrome extension. Mm-hmm. Um, it's paid and our district mm-hmm. pays for it. Now, you, there, well, there's mm-hmm. the free version and then there's the upgrade. Mm-hmm. And you, you basically, you turn it on and it will do like screen masking. So it'll only show you like, you know, it, it darkens the rest of the screen and you can read like one chunk at a time. Um, you can highlight a section and it will read it to you out loud. And it will even, this is what I love. It will read it to you in accents. So if I, if I'm Mexican and I learned English in Mexico to start, I likely had a teacher with a Mexican accent. Mm -hmm. So if I'm hearing an American accent or if I'm hearing a British accent, I may not be able to understand. Whereas if I can flip it so that the person reading to me has that accent I'm used to. I didn't know that was in there. Yeah. Really? You can totally change the voice. I'm thinking of, even though we can't use it within our organization, my students can use it at home. So English yeah. accent, English mm-hmm. accent from a region, right? Is what yeah. It, it, and that call, is like, so who, who cool. do you want reading to you? Do you want like Jen from Canada? And I'm saying about like, <laughs> instead of however <laughs> everyone else in the world says it. Um, I'm, I'm making sure that the letter U is in everything that I say. Color, not color. Did you hear it? You oh, hear yeah. <laughs> so we... Um, yeah, that that to me is is incredible. And I, I've used that with English language learners. Like, I don't really understand. You can also slow down the rate at which it's read to you. So for me, um, I'm, I'm like the only podcast I can't listen to when I if I do listen to mine, which it was actually to our friend Tom Covington who said, of course, you have to listen to yours. Would you would you do a blog post and not proofread it first? I'm like, oh, I never really looked at it. That <laughs> Good point. I, just, I don't want to like who likes the sound of their own voice other than Morgan Freeman, like nobody. Um, so we. Um, I, when I do listen to it, I'm the only podcast that I can listen. To, I have to listen to in single speed because I speak so quickly. Um, so when I listen to things, when I want something read to me using Google Read and Write, and again, this UDL model, like sometimes I'm like, okay, well, I want to read this article, but I'm doing something else. So I'm just going to open Google Read and Write. And as I'm doing whatever I'm doing in my office or wherever I am, I have it read to me and I go double speed. But for our English language learners, they might go down to 75% speed mm-hmm. instead of two times, right? Because just hearing it more slowly, and and I know this from just my own language acquisition, like if I'm if I'm watching, for example, I just finished Ozark and which, oh my God, they're so good. Um, <laughs> so I, I watched Ozark and speaking mm-hmm. Spanish, I could pick up a, a lot of what they said when they were talking to the cartel. But sometimes I was like, oh, no, it's just it's too quick for me. So if I'm listening to Spanish, often I will slow it down. So I'm like, oh, OK, I, I can understand. I kind of have to see the words in my head as well. Um, so that's something that really works. There's just so much in there that that can be used by students. Um, like I said, it's it's free. You can pay like pay the premium to upgrade mm-hmm. it. But it's it's so, so good. It's for our English language so learners. much. This stuff. is cool. Yeah, this is really cool. I'll ha- I'm going to have to play with it. Um, I haven't. Um, only because, yeah, if, if we're not using it, it's harder for me to explore certain things. Um, during the pandemic, they made an allowance for it. But yes. right now it's like, nope, we're moving to Microsoft Teams and all of that, which oh, is foreign to me. <laughs> yeah, so, let yeah. Me, so a few things here, like just, and for anyone who hasn't played with this before, there's a few cool, extra cool features that I like in there too. One is the mm-hmm. highlighting and isolating feature. So like you can yes. highlight in like, purple, yellow, green, and pink or something like that. And then you click a button and it will create a whole new Google Doc isolating each of those oh, wow. words. And then it will turn, oh, wow. it, you can actually turn them into like a pic, a separate picture dictionary sheet with notes available, like that you can go add your own notes into it. And then like, and then the students can, and you can, so for your class, you might choose like a lot of times I do parts of speech. So they'll be like, okay, highlight nouns in pink, highlight adjectives in green. And so then they're isolating all these words and they're creating their own whole vocab lists in there. And it's incredible because the best thing about it is 
I've showed it to students, you know, I'm like, okay, here's a thing that you can use. And we have to move on with our class a lot of the time. And then I'll have a student come back to me like a year later and they're like, I'm still using it. It's so good. Like yeah, all the that's time. So cool. And it, they're just using it for their own daily use. Right. It's, mm-hmm. it's really, really powerful. So um, it's yeah. great too, for students when they're, when they're researching, cause it's Google, um, those kind of tools are often built into databases as well. So we use Gale um, as one of our databases. And that's mm-hmm. one thing that the collecting the highlights. So I have students say, okay, well, when you're reading this, if you know your research paper has three parts to it, and you're like, oh, this could be used in part one, and this could be used in three, and this could be used in two, oh, this is one again, highlight in those, you know, colors, so that afterwards, it creates that document, and then you have everything, okay, point one, here's everything together, and point two, here's everything together, it's just... It works so for my brain because that's how I used to do things. Like I would write sticky notes and then have like sticky notes all over the place, like, you know, bulked up and bunched up where they need to go um, so that it was on the single topic. And it just it just really helps with organization. It's it's amazing what, you know, they have access to now versus what I did back, you know, oh, when I was un- in university like six years ago. Unbelievable. I mean, it really is. It, it's such a different world for language learning these days. And I'm like. A big part of me is like super jealous because I'm like, can you imagine? Like, I, I used to carry around a box and like <laughs> it was probably, uh, you know, 12 to 15 inches long and, you know, four inches by four inches. And it was just filled with flashcards. And I carried yep. this thing around <laughs> with me and I would just flip, 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 you know, and I had, I had those, this was when the coolest new technology was flashcards that come on a ring. You remember that? Like, yeah, like the little, the awesome. littler ones that they had the ring on uh-huh. it. And I like spent all this money and I got these rings and like, and I was like, okay, flipping through these flashcards. And I'm like, yeah, this, there's nothing better than this. And then it, you know, go figure that once I become a teacher, then there's a million times bigger capacity in my pocket without having to carry a giant box around like a fool wherever yeah. I go. <laughs> uh, um, right. Another one that oh, yeah. I, mm-hmm. if people, if people are looking for things to read to them too, like you, Google read and write, of course, so like I said, is, is paid, but there's another one that's called natural reader um, text to speech, and it will listen to email, web pages, Google docs, PDFs, Kindle books, and actually read to you through AI, but in a natural voice. Mm-hmm. So if, if someone's looking for something quick that they're like, Oh yeah, it's, it's easier. Like I, I'm an audiobook fan. Like I read over 60 books last year and I want to say 55 of them were audiobooks mm-hmm. because when I'm cooking or when I'm driving mm-hmm. or when, you know, my kids are talking about Minecraft and I hide, you know, my <laughs> behind my hair, um, I, uh, like, mm-hmm, I'm, I'm listening mm-hmm. to, mm-hmm, yeah, mm-hmm, 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 mm-hmm. <laughs> or even just like reshelving books in the library and, and hanging out doing whatever. I, I'm almost always listening to a book and the kids are like, why do you always have your AirPods? And I'm like, I'm listening to a book. Um, and so I, I think that for me, me, I love to have things read to me and especially if it's really dense material, right? I, I, I like to read along, but also hear it. Um, so that's one that I've used to natural. It's called natural reader text to speech and it's, it's free. It's Chrome extension. It works really well. Um, I, I really like it for that. And then there's another one I'm trying to find it. There's, it's, I, I feel like it's called maybe Toucan or something. Do I have it on this account? That I mean, sounds yeah. familiar. So Toucan, you can learn a new language by browsing the internet. So let's think about our teach. Oh, I heard the about there. That one I heard. I totally. (laughs) Um, um, Let's think about our teachers who might have a bunch of kids. Like at my school, we have most of our English language learners are Iranian, or we have a lot of um, exchange students or like visa students who are coming in from China. So let's say I wanted to start to learn some Farsi. Toucan allows you, no, I don't, I actually don't know if Farsi is one of them, but you can learn a new language while browsing the internet. So you, you add this extension and you turn it on. And then depending on how much you want to immerse yourself, it'll change certain words in what you're reading into the desired language. So that as I'm reading and using my, like, you know, I know how to read skills, right? Like all my, um, all, all the nuances of reading, like my prediction skills and my, my reading around text. And I might be reading and be like, oh, that's supposed to say house. And oh, okay, it says maison, if I'm learning French. And I can click the word and it will say it aloud to me so that as I'm reading, I can slowly learn words in other languages to eventually become more and more fluent in the language. And like I said, it can start with only like, you know, a peppering of words throughout to like changing half of what you're reading if you're further along in that language. And I think as a way to learn another language, and if you want to learn the languages that your students are speaking and maybe like throw words in here and there for them, I think it'd be a really cool thing for teachers to to be able to check out. 
this is super interesting. That is really so cool. I'm looking at it yeah. right now. It's on uh, yeah, join2can.com. Like, T-O-U-C-A. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'd heard about it before somewhere, I'm sure, because it sounded familiar, but I'd never, I didn't know what it did. I knew it was something with languages. That is very, it's, very cool. It's, it's really cool. And so for me, like, like I said, my Spanish and Italian are rusty. So I turned it on for that every now and then. I'm like, okay, let's challenge mm-hmm. myself as I'm reading an article. And I'll be like, oh yeah, that word. Um, sometimes it's hard. I had once, I was like, oh, I could probably do this. And I had it like a medium setting. I was like, okay, yeah, apparently I'm way more rusty than I thought. And I had to, <laughs> I had to make it a bit easier for myself, but it's, it's a really, it's a cool thing. And, and if you have students in speaking different languages, again, like maybe you partner up. And so I speak French. So you're going to put some French words to learn and like to build those relationships in our class too. It could just be a fun community building exercise. Oh yeah. This is amazing. There's, this there's, is cool. There's definitely <laughs> yeah, some stuff to I'm, I'm playing with, with just too. the, just the, okay. Just so the... I'll wrap up the podcast. Well, uh, well Brent, <laughs> Nick, we'll play with you can. So thanks for joining us, everyone. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I am un genio. Is that right? It was. Did, did I call myself genio? Is a genius? genius? Yeah. A genius. Oh yeah. Genio. That's how it does it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've learned Spanish. <laughs> that is cool. Yeah. That is very cool. Yeah. There's a lot of stuff to play with. So I I love all of this. There's so much interesting. Uh, you know, so many interesting places to go with all of these things, and and so many ways to help your students kind of grow. And I, I love that all of these too, like. In particular, Jen, I'm thinking like, you know, these students can also come into the library and jump on a computer and have access to all of these things, right? Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. sometimes, you know, when you're language learning, it's like, oh, you know, can I do this from home? Can I do it? whatever? Am I going to get the support to make sure that I know how to do it? And so I love how the, the, the access to all of this inside of a library too and just being able to say, hey, there's a place that's going to support you. And especially if, if you're putting – um, an, an ESL teacher right in there that's saying like, Hey, I know how to help you guys get through all of this. It makes a lot yeah. of sense because that can provide, you know, it's a, it's like a support level that maybe a lot of students didn't know that they needed, um, or that, that, that they could really benefit from. I think a lot of times oh, yeah. classroom teachers, you know, obviously everybody's doing their best, but like, it's very hard to accommodate every person's needs and every, everything. And like, Oh, like even for me, I'm like, Oh yeah, I, I know read and write. We have it. But like last semester it skipped my mind. Like I just didn't like, I was like, Oh, (laughs) I was doing other things. Right. And so I didn't teach it to my students last semester, but I'm also like, well, it would be so cool to have just in the library or in the language, you know, we have a language center at our school too. It's like, Hey, come in here, get access to support at different levels, here are all sorts of tools and things that can help you out too. And this is a place Mm -hmm. where you can come to learn these things that definitely can be a benefit to you inside of the classroom, but also can help you outside in the, in the, the extended world too. And yeah, and teacher librarians can be so underutilized, right? People, I have people all the time come in, they're like, can I just ask you a question about this? I'm like, yeah, that's, that's my job. (laughs) Um, I I, I don't, I don't want to bother you. I'm like, you're you're not, it's my job. (laughs) Um, And, and just things that we can do, like even having a teacher, like sometimes in the moment I can't, but I'm like, give me 24 hours and I'll get you that that answer. Like I love, like I, I have, you know, a, a really active professional learning network on Twitter. And I've had teachers come in and say, do you know about this? And I'm like, "Mm, I don't, but give me two hours and I'll tweet it out. And I tag some people that I think are, you know, might have the answer for me. And I usually get something back. Um, So I'm, I'm constantly telling the teachers in my building, like, yeah, use me, especially during the pandemic when I, I was actually a shelved librarian for one of the years I was, I was redeployed to the classroom. But for this year, I'm like, yeah, if you're exhausted, like reach out to your teacher librarians and say like, is there a lesson that you could do with my kids? And cause we know a lot of your curriculum, right? We know your standards. We know like that's, a big part of our job. And we might have a lesson that we're like, Oh, we could do this. Or just even, I I actually have a contest that I run in our library. I have a a form that I fill out at the end of every day. And it's, I I put everyone into a draw. And at the end of each semester, I draw one name and they win a prize for using the learning commons. So it could be, you know, you use the space uh, for a guest speaker. It could be you co-planned a lesson with me, or you let me teach a lesson. Uh, It could be that you were featured on our social media, like anything that happens during the day. And they always forget. And at the end of the year, I'm like, okay, now we're doing the draw and people are like, oh yeah, I forgot. I came to the library a ton. Maybe I'll win. And, um, 
But there's all those things. And I, I purposely put it out there at the beginning of every semester to remind them, like, these are all the things that I can do for you. So you might just be like, I need three days because, you know, maybe there was a death in the family. Mm-hmm. Um, for for me, I'm like, okay, bring them down and we'll do some like how to research properly. Maybe I'll do, you know, something on social media, something on fake and fake news or missing disinformation. Um, maybe I do a day of sketch noting because I've done that too, that I, I work like the entire day. I bring two classes down every period and I teach them usually sort of a month out of like finals I say as you're about to start studying here's a, here's a strategy that might be helpful for you and I have the day of sketch noting and I just sort of teach kids the basics and I've had kids come back I've walked around the library at this one kid was drawing these beautiful sketch notes I'm like oh how long have you been doing this like oh no just since like you taught me last week but she was really artistic and yeah. she's like, this is for she goes I'm going to totally be able to remember all this stuff from my history my grade 10 history exam because now it's, I'm so visual and this just works for me. Like it hadn't even occurred to her to keep notes that way. Right. And mm-hmm. so there's, you can really lean hard on, on a teacher librarian and build that, uh, that relationship. It's, it's so key. Like I have, I'm a mentor for a first year teacher. Well, she's actually her second year now, but she comes down all the time and she's like, okay, here's the next unit. And she just wants to talk it out. And, you know, I have 20 plus years of knowledge stored up and, and because I've seen in this role, so many other things that other people are doing. Like I haven't just been in this sort of, you know, the, the, you know, blinders on close your door, my classroom, um, we're exposed to a lot, like, which is why it's a big reason I let people just use the space. Like there's a lot of teacher librarians who are like, Nope, it's only for programming. If you're not going to partner with me, you're not coming in. I'm like, Oh no, 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 no. Because I love for them to come in and I sit and I like watch a lesson or I just half listen to what they're doing. And I grow so much, right. It's sort of, you know, that have you ever had a pineapple chart in a class where Mm -hmm. or in a school, have you ever done the the walkthrough days, right? That's, that's my job all day, every day is watching other people and how they react, how they teach, how they treat students, like ways that they, like I, I've seen some really gifted teachers talk to students who would otherwise be really challenging, like just go to the office or whatever and and see how they handle just behavior management even is is just so huge. Like it's, I'm, I'm really fortunate to have the position I do because it's it's PD all day, every day. It's <laughs> It's fantastic. So Jen, obviously there is so much that you could share with us um, and we're very lucky to have you today. We're definitely going to have to hit you up for an episode on sketch noting because I think mm-hmm. that in itself, uh, Brent and I always talk about how we think the tools that we know and are familiar with, everybody knows, but actually there's just a group every year that doesn't know about it, hasn't heard about it, and maybe some people need refreshers. And so we're definitely going to have to ask you back on the show so right now let's go ahead and <laughs> jump out <laughs> transition <laughs> we're gonna move i'm gonna help you move transition uh, I'm right glitching out. this morning <laughs> <laughs> all right uh yeah so lots of stuff to think about and let's mm-hmm. jump over All right, so Jen, uh, every time we do a uh, a thing called fun finds, and we try and find something fun, so we'll start off. Uh, this is just anything that's kind of making you happy, or that's been enjoyable, or whatever it is recently. And so, uh, Eshel will start with her choices here. Did um, you say Eshel? Eshel. I don't know why. Eshel. I, I don't know why. I, put that, I, I noticed that as soon as I said Eshel. it, I'm like, maybe I'm hanging out with Canadians too much these days. Um, I, 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 <laughs> Michelle, We're all glitching. Uh, yeah, I'm a, I was like, We're as glitching. soon as it came out of my mouth, I'm like, that doesn't sound right. Um, <laughs> the emphasis is on the wrong syllab. We're all, yeah. <laughs> Hey, it's summer break, man. I don't need to think about anything, dude. It's just like, no. let's just hang pool out. Boy Brent. Let's just hang pool out with the boy pool. Brent. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, Michelle, uh, yes. you start us off. What's your All fun right. find? So, my fun find is, and I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly, it's Siate London Coconut Setting Powder. It is cruelty free and it's vegan. Um, it it's it's just a translucent powder, very light. You use it um, on your over your makeup to set it. Uh, and I like products that are easy on the skin. And this was a brand that I found. I don't know where I found it, but then I tried a couple of other products, and um, they're a little bit pricey for me. But I thought that this was worth. Um, I've loved it so far. And here in Texas, it's humid and sticky, and so wearing makeup just feels really gross but um this powder has just been it's it's kind of been life-saving and it doesn't cake or add any heaviness to your face so that's siate london coconut setting powder so sorry to be ignorant here but what does setting makeup mean what does that 
I, I know I'm being like a, a, a dude, but like, but I think there's other people so, that might not know too. Yeah. So uh, usually, you know, you we put different products on our faces, mm-hmm. different layers of things. It could be your SPF uh, or it could be your foundation. And sometimes it just feels like it's melting off or it can, you know, if you're wearing a mask or if you're touching your face, it rubs off on your skin or clothing with the powder. It sets it. So it's sort of like, I don't know. It doesn't, it doesn't come off. Oh, so it it's lasts like longer setting, on like your setting skin. concrete, like like putting the chemicals in so that the <laughs> exactly. <doesn't> <laughs> Sometimes that's what it feels like to wear makeup. <laughs> yeah, and if you see face. someone with a concrete face, they're wearing the wrong kind of setting powder. <laughs> okay, uh, I'll leave it at that. Um, so mine is going to be a TV show on um, on uh, Hulu and FX right now. It's a new mini series uh, called Pistol, and it's about it's the history of the Sex Pistols um, from Ooh. the very beginning until. I, I actually haven't gotten to the end, but I'm assuming it's going to end around the end of the Sex Pistols um, uh, when Sid Vicious died. But um, it's been super cool. Like it's it's just an interesting, dramatic telling of uh, all, the whole story from very early on all the way until you know through their success and with um, you know the, all their crazy stories. And you know I. I I was never a big Sex Pistols fan. Like, you know, my, my punk rock uh, bona fides come up through different uh, different zones in the punk rock world. But, but of course, like, it's such a big band. Like, so, so well-known, so influential for, for that type of music and everything. So I just thought it was really interesting. Plus, it's a kind of a cool look at, like, 70s UK and being able to see, like, all the weird stuff that was going on. And then a final seal of approval is that Johnny Rotten himself said that it's absolutely atrocious. And he... <laughs> and so when when Johnny Rotten talks <laughs> trash on something about Johnny Rotten, you know it's probably worth watching. So um, <laughs> so that is uh, Pistol. It's it's only, I think, like six or seven episodes. So if you're, if you're up for that, it might be an interesting summer watch. Jen, what do you got? Okay. So I was originally going to share these like collapsible um, crates that I have mm. that make picking up everything like my groceries and traveling so good. But then I, then I remembered something else. It's, it's techie, but not techie. Okay. So it's called radio. <laughs> it's, and have it's, you heard of it? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> let me, let me tell you about this. <laughs> we just got this thing called radio in Canada. It's like AM and FM. No, I'm kidding. The tech moves um, slowly <laughs> north. <right? laughs> you know what? You, you aren't going to have international guests if you keep making fun of us. <laughs> okay, anyway, well, it's we, radio. We can talk about a lot of problems here, with, too. Radio <laughs> with an OU. It's radio with five O's, Are you serious? Which sounds ridiculous. Yep. So okay. it's radio. I'm gonna I'm gonna put it in the chat. Three, four, three, it's two. radio.com. And hold on, I'm gonna throw it in here. The idea is I've only played with it a little, but I thought, oh, this is kind of cool. And it's um they call it the musical time machine. So you can go in to radio mm-hmm. and you can pick any country in the world and you can pick any decade and it will play you music from that country in that decade. Uh, that is awesome. That is cool. So I'm thinking if, especially given, you know, the, the theme of your podcast, if you wanted to have students, you know, share music that reminds them of being oh at home, my or gosh. What their parents mm-hmm. or grandparents used to play. Mm. They don't have every country. They don't have every decade. It is mm-hmm. building slowly. Um, but it was really cool to me. Like when I first discovered it, I was working with music teachers on this, like music culture, um, assignment that they did and I found it like two weeks later and I was like where was this when we were looking (laughs) all this stuff but it's it's really cool um you join with an account I think you can log in I think I just use my Google or Apple or something to get into it um maybe Facebook but you you don't have to have an account and I can go in and I was like okay so if I want to look up like British India in the 1930s it will all of a sudden just start playing it'll tell you a little bit about the artist and tell you who discovered it so it's you know people from all over the world it's like crowdsourced and it plays this music. And I think it's a really cool way to hear about cultures um, yeah. around the world, to see music development, to show like the roots of music. Mm-hmm. Like, wow, I really, you know, if, if you know, a band was really influenced by, you know, let's say, I, I can't even think. So like African tribal music mm-hmm. um, in the 1950s, why not go back and listen to more of that? And I think you can discover some really cool artists. And as a, a fan of music and especially new music that I've never heard before, it's just a, it's a really cool rabbit hole to fall down. 
I love oh, that, that is really cool because, you know, sometimes students will say, oh, I like Mexican music because it sounds like Arabic. And you're like, wait a minute, you're picking up beats. And then, you know, students from places in Africa will say, oh, that has African beats. And so you can start to see that we're all, you know, tied here and there. Exactly. Mm-hmm. But um, Jen, could you share about your collapsible? <laughs> oh, I, can, I, can. So, I, I, I need to know about these crates. <laughs> the crates, so they are, the they are really plastic and the, the ends, so they're rectangular and the mm-hmm. ends fold in. I got them on Amazon. They're called, and I got them on Amazon Canada, but they're red ski, like R-E-A-D-S-K-Y folding crates. Okay. They come in a pack of four and they were $10 each. So for $40 Canadian, which is about $32 American, I want to say mm-hmm. right now, um, the ends come in and then there's, they sort of like fold, like almost like an X in and they go from like full crates that are, I forget the dimensions of them. It probably says in the thing. Hold on, let me open it up. The dimensions of them are not going to show. Oh, of course, now my Amazon is not playing nicely with me. Anyway, I want to say they're maybe 15 or 18 inches by about 12 wide. And they collapse down to nothing. So I can take a whole stack of them. Like one box would be like about six of them stacked, but now I can carry things around. So like for a classroom, they're really Mm -hmm. fantastic. We have a pop-up tent trailer and her name is Trailer Swift. So we take them into Trailer Swift a lot (laughs) um, to carry things back and forth Um, for grocery pickups because we do our groceries at, we do pickup at Walmart since before pandemic. Like we were Mm -hmm. picking up groceries online since before before it was, it was like cool in fact <laughs> at the beginning at the beginning of the pandemic when you couldn't get any at least up here like you could not you could not get a spot because like they were like you know all taken we went back to walmart and they were like oh my gosh we were so worried about you guys we haven't seen you in a month and we're like oh my gosh we were like <laughs> as as norm is to cheers the giffins are to the local walmart this is a problem <laughs> but anyway we um we, we use them for absolutely everything. So if you are like me and are a maximalist, I don't call myself a hoarder because it's not messy. I just have a lot of stuff that's nicely organized. Um, they're fantastic. And with the kids, like my, my boys play baseball. So we like just pile everything into one of those and we have it. But then when baseball's over, I can collapse it and use it for something else. Or like, I don't, they're just, I love them. That so sounds much. like something to keep in the back of my car because yeah, carrying my things hand. from from um room to room and you never really know when you need that because yeah, that, you know take up a lot yeah. of space mm-hmm. that sounds cool love it tons of stuff to check out all right you could win a one-of-a-kind diesel pin by leaving us a review on apple Podcasts, and it would be the first one for 2022 and we're already halfway through the year so I we know. need one for this yeah, year we need one we need a 2022 review yeah, please review us. If you're giving us a shout out any other way, tag us on social media. We are on all the platforms. All right. We are also on Patreon uh, if you want to do some support for the show. And of course, you can listen to other episodes at diesel.org slash 64, the number 64, or you can listen at Voice Ed Canada. You can find us on Twitter. The show is at Diesel Pod and I am at Brent G. Warner. I'm Ishel at Ixy underscore Pixie. That's I-X-Y underscore P-I-X-Y. And you can Jen. find Jen. Yeah, where are you, Jen? Where are you all over the place? I am <laughs> at Virtual GIF. That's a hard G and two Fs. Mm-hmm. Pretty much everywhere on social media. <laughs> virtual GIF. Awesome. Um, thank you so much. In French, thank you is merci. So merci for tuning in to the Diesel Podcast. Thank you.